Welcome to another edition of Interruptions. I'm your host, Otis Smith. My next guest today is a CEO of her own company, uh, 360 Total Concept. Uh, she is a civic leader. She was appointed to President Obama's Platform Committee for the uh, Democratic National Convention. I'm talking about the lovely, the beautiful, and the brilliant Shonda Scott. How you doing this evening? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. We don't take uh, take it lightly. Thank you for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for inviting me. I'm I'm honored. Thank you. I like the hat. I like the hat. I see. I see. You. <laughs> <laughs> My first question that I have for you: uh, You do so much. You're the CEO of your own company. Uh, where Where does the the entrepreneur spirit come from? For you well for me it's in my blood we're a fourth gen i'm a fourth generation business owner my great grandfather okay. was a son of a slave enslaved black woman and a slave owner born wow. in slavery and he moved he after he was free he moved he moved later on when he was an adult he moved our family to denver colorado where he became a developer and built okay. resort, re, re, built resorts in the Rocky Mountains for the segregated black areas and mm -hmm. in the National Museum of African uh, History and Culture. The, okay. the Rocky Mountains is called uh, Lincoln's Lodge, Lincoln Hills, Colorado. And we okay. still have a cabin in our family since 1926 that he built that's still wow. in our life. So, yeah, wow. and it's an area where uh, all the celebrities that were black that came to Denver to perform they stayed at a place that my grandfather helped build this next door to our cabin called the Winks Lodge. And that's where they had to stay because it was segregated sure. in Colorado. And so they stayed there. So this was an area that where blacks had these resorts, cabin mm -hmm. resorts built. And now um, the billionaire Robert Smith that grew up in Denver has made that area popular because he bought the land that's on the Colorado River and built a fly fishing resort that he brings wow. young African-American men there to, to, you know, give them exposure to the cat fishing and culture and all that. And he has kept that legacy going as well as my uncle, my uncle, my cousin that's in okay. our family, the judge there. And my, my aunt who's 96, who still lives in the same block that my grandfather built the home, but they remodeled it since then for 96 okay. years. So we have a long history. And then my parents own one of the largest African-American owned businesses and food services in the United States back in the 80s. So entrepreneurship and on my grandfather on my mom's side, my grandfather was a land owner, although he only had an eighth grade education. He was a real estate land owner and, and a farmer and had property in Houston. So my my entrepreneurial spirit is in my blood, you know, it's right. Like, I don't know. Every, anytime I think of anything, I think of it in the, the thought of a, a business. Um, you know, everything is about business. And even even if it's empowering women and young people is about empowering sure. about entrepreneurship and business. It's like they talk about the uh, the pay gap and women not getting paid equally. I'm right. like, well, start your own business. You can control your income. Okay. You can control what you pay the women that work for you and the men that work for you if you own your own business. And, you know, Correct. sky is the limit to how you grow based if you own your own business. There's no ceiling for that. It's based on how big you want to be and how big you how much work you want to put into it to be that. So so I always say it's in my blood to be an entrepreneur. I've That's a, people, but the entrepreneur spirit is in my blood. That's amazing. And the reason I say that <laughs> is because I'm pretty sure with your family, you know, from from your grandparents to your parents to you, just like you said, it's in your blood that you, you couldn't be lazy in the family. Like you couldn't be just sitting around like, you, you know, like I, I'm chilling. No, nah, I ain't no chilling. Well, you, you, nah, you, well, you, I'm that way. But I mean, you could be lazy in the family now. You know, they do okay. people. It's just that my my personality isn't that. So I'm always I got you. Yeah, but yeah, you you but you're right. My line from my me, my mom, my mom to me to my son. Yeah, right. right. There's no there's no laziness there because this is like my parents. I was always a joke with all my friends that work for my parents when we were growing up in different capacities. It's like if you spent the night at our house more than two nights, you were going to work by the oh, third. Wow. Night. You were working on some project. <laughs> they needed you oh, for something. Wow. They recruited. You know, my mom had a successful catering business at one time, so all of my friends 
you know, sure, work there sure. at some point because she needed staff and, and they had um, airport concessions. So in the summer, a number of my friends, that would be the job that they worked while they were in school and, the, you know, going to okay, college okay. and pay their college tuition and everything. So, yeah, like you need to recruit people. Our house would be the place you was going to be recruited. Like if you still always laugh, like if you stayed there more than two nights, by the third night you was working on something. Oh, wow. Well, you know, that's funny because you don't even have to ask for a job. You're like, look, I'm going to go over Shonda House and I'm going to stay by the week and I'm going to make me some money. <laughs> they going to they go, right. Stay. You ain't got to ask for it. You going to work. Just stay stay longer than 48 hours and see what happens. It was a fun house, but everybody worked. But everybody wanted to work if they wanted to stay there. They're like, we don't want to leave, so we going to work. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. That yeah, is so. amazing. Now, uh, I, in the in introduction, I talked about you uh, being appointed uh, by President Obama uh, during the uh, Democratic National Convention. Um, how how important is politics in everyday life? And the reason I'm asking you this question, just to give you some context, is that I remember growing up, and maybe yourself uh, or people that you knew around you, you know, we always make that comment, I'm not into politics. That's not my thing. Because we were ba basically what we were trying to say is, I'm not trying to run for office, mm -hmm. any type of office. But with with I would say with this whole last uh, this past election, we've learned that politics actually is every day. It's not really necessarily because you're running uh, for office. <laughs> Can you uh, speak to uh, how the what the import the, the importance of politics in everyday life? Yeah. So for me, my uh, our family has always been politically involved. My my parents always had us engaged in some kind of advocacy for the betterment of our community to make sure that people who look like us were represented at the local level, at the state and national level, that it's, that was always important to my family. Even in business, they know that they knew that as business owners, we feel like it's our responsibility to support those who are stepping out to be public servants, you know, because okay. they're they could go, they could be in business too. They could be doing something else, but they're, they're public servants to support the community and they've made that commitment. So then the ecosystem should be that businesses support them. Like one of the most successful black owned business owners in construction is a man named, uh, he's a late man, he's passed away since, but his name was Herman Russell. And he was okay. one of Martin Luther King's best friends in Atlanta. Nobody okay. knew about Mr. Russell until he, his business blew all the way up, but he always was successful. But he funded a lot of the work that Dr. King had to do because Dr. King didn't have an income. He was a pastor. He was out there for the advocacy, you know, but he all that he that work he needed to do had to be supported by something. So there were some there's um, pictures that you see if you went to the restaurant that Mr. Russell and his wife owned. Um, it was called Pascal's, and it was a, a legendary restaurant where the civil rights meetings were made, and they talked over fried chicken, right? So it's still mm -hmm. in Atlanta today, and now the uh, Russell family still own it. But you see these okay. giant pictures of Martin Luther King. You'll see um, Reverend Abernathy. You'll see... Andrew Young, you see Jesse Jackson, and you'll see this other gentleman. The other gentleman is Herman Russell, and they're at Herman okay. Russell's house. So, you know, so business should always interconnect. And for Blacks, we somehow miss that in some of our generational passing down that that there's no connection to business. Like, if you want to be political, you've been political. And if you want to be in business, you're going a whole different path. Where the best scenarios, when we all are an ecosystem and we're, you know, the advocacy is supporting the policy and the businesses are supporting the policy and they're supporting the advocate and it's all connected because it all impacts us. So what we've learned and what more people have learned in this last election is that how much the person in office and all these different levels impact your life, like the DA, the yeah, attorney right. for the state, you realize right. that governors make policy for your day-to-day -day lives. So if you're not engaged in the political process, you're pretty much letting someone else have control over your life. You've let your rights be given to someone else in essence. And so a lot of people, there was an era decades when I, you like, when we were probably growing up that right. it became focused on business people, get all you can be a business person. That's about making money. And I'm not, right. they realized when they got to a certain level, if they needed to do certain deals or needed to buy certain land or one, mm -hmm. 
They need a political access, political connection. And they were so disconnected from it. Like, it didn't matter how much money they had. If they didn't have the relationship with the politicians uh, to know how to move the project forward or what's the best way to reinvest in this community or all those things, they, you know, they had a disconnect. So they realized it didn't even matter that you may have made all this amount of money on Wall Street when you came home and you wanted to buy a lot of land and build a build a high rise. And you don't know, and you realize the elected officials had to approve you buying that, and the right. community had to buy into it. Your money didn't matter in that regard, right? It's just like so that so understanding, and I always understood that just because that's how my parents were. They were successful sure. in business, but they were successful in community. You know, part of their business model was hiring black people so that they had a place to work where other people may not have hired them, and so all of that is about politics. Like now politicians are talking about local programs and local hire because they realize that in order to have a successful community, they have to have mm -hmm. money invested back into their local community. They have to hire people locally so that they're successful because then that means more money for the whole system. So it's a whole, I call it an ecosystem. It's like it all connects. And saying people would say that like, I'm not political. I'm not, you like everything's political, really. Like even if you're trying to get a job, you have to work some kind of politics to get the person to hire you. It's just like everything right. fails, everything is political. And you saying that you're not is like you compromising or, or, it, uh, or gives, turning your rights over to someone else to control. And for me, I don't think that's what our civil rights are about. It's like we have these rights, we should exercise them. And then we have a say so in what's happening in our community and in our lives, and not just for us, but for the generations that come after right. us. Well, and, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because that was the thing. Um, because, like, for me, I give you an example. So, so before this election here uh, in Georgia, because I'm in Georgia, okay. so, uh, you know, Stacey, well, you had Lakeisha Lance Bottom first. And but that really then because I'm outside of Atlanta, so I couldn't vote for her if I wanted to. Oh, I see. Because I don't live in the city of Atlanta. But oh yeah, well, I'm 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 a supporter yeah. now. Right. Uh, no, I'm a supporter. California, so you can support her even if you can't. Oh, oh no, most definitely I'm a supporter. Right. So then I didn't know who Stacey Abram was, mm -hmm. right? Until she was running for governor. So can you talk about because this I find this dynamic real interesting. If there is Obama, if there is a uh, Stacey Abram, you know, or Lakeisha Bottom, you know, or uh, Kamala, it's easy as an African-American sometimes because you see someone that looks like you, right? So you're going to support, right? But what happens when there are two Caucasian people running from office and the dynamics become a little bit different. You see what I'm saying? Like, if you would have had uh, Trump running and then you had Biden, mm -hmm. but if Biden wouldn't have chosen Harris, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Then sometimes it's a, it's like, okay, well, for me, it was still, I still would have voted for Biden. I mean, I mean, let's just be real. Right. Right. But, but you get what I'm saying? When it's two, when it's two uh, Caucasian people running for a particular office and there's not a, a minority to get that big minority support, right? How do we go about uh, researching, finding out who's who? Like you said, from the D district attorney, uh, a judge running, or someone running for governor, you know, how do you find out who the best cast your vote for um, when you're trying to find out who to vote for, you know, when an election is coming up, if you're not familiar with that person already? Well, I mean, Google has a great deal of research, of course, right? But right. I mean, a lot of people come to, like, people come to me, people come to, I go to people. It's like you go to people who you trust their opinion. That's why it's so important that candidates have surrogates that are just people and leaders in the community that that people would trust because that's what it's usually about. It's like a re referral. Like, if I like, if you say it's okay and I, I trust you, then I'm going to go for whoever you say kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's like, but importantly, too, for you individually is to get engaged with political action groups. You know, I okay. mean, NAACP is very involved still, even though they can't pick a candidate. They can educate you on the issues. They can highlight forums. I mean, we go to, we host 
um, community forums all the time. Like your local black chamber is a good place to go to meet people and to find out more about the importance of politics. Because during the campaign season, there's always going to be these forums where you can hear for yourself what someone is saying about these issues. And I don't, okay. I don't look at it as a black, white color. I think it's important to have people that reflect what the United States look like. And I want people who look like me in places because it just, it tells for younger people, it, it shows what the possibilities are, but I don't want anybody there. That's not going to be supporting black businesses and black and, sure. and, the, and, and helping to close the racial wealth gap that is negatively impacting all of us, not just black people, everybody, right? right. We're all in that scenario. So if that could, person could be white, brown or yellow or whatever, sure. it's like, if they're supporting what's right. I mean, that's why you said you probably said you picked a certain person because you know that they're going to support things that don't just help a small few or they right. don't or doesn't just help a small few that look like you and don't care about anybody else. Just to say right. I did this for three people and then right. it's a millions or you know, hundreds of thousands of people are starving and dying. Right. So you can look for. And that's like me with business, it's like you want to work with people and have clients and vote for people who have the same morals and values that you feel are important to you. And you want to have people that you feel that have morals and values that are important to not this, just this generation, but generations that follow, because it's what we're doing right now is for the future. Like right. what we're living right now has happened in the past. So what we're living on is past people's work that's now manifesting. What we're doing right now is for work in the future to manifest. So we're working to help, my son and my, you know, his kids and his kids, you know, what we do now, the seeds we're planting now are for trees that will be shade for the future. Not, gotcha. you can't plant a seed right now and see a tree tomorrow. We're not going to see right. that. And that's what's happening with anything that we do is all for the future in this moment. Because what we're living in the present was done based on something that happened in the past. Correct. And that, and that's, I'm glad you said that. And that's why I was asking that question because I know for so many others, and, you, and, and if you think about it in all walk of life, like even in sports, with my sports background, you look and you see an African-American quarterback, we root, we champion. Now, and it doesn't mean that the that the uh, white quarterback is not a good guy, whatever. It's just that you're seeing someone that looks like you. So <laughs> I will people that are, are trying to understand the political process, uh, researching. I wanted to ask that question because, like you said, it, it, it may not be a minority running all the time. You still need to know the issues. You still need to know who to cast your vote to, and, you know, who to support. Um, and so that's why sometimes it's just easy when you see another minority. It's like, oh, yep, yeah, that's where I'm going. Because there's some people who look like, like they said, you know, all Skin folk, all kin folk ain't skin. Y'all, all skin folks aren't your kin folks. Meaning, like, Correct. everybody who looks like you is not looking out for your best interest. Like, there Correct. was an initiative that was spearheaded by African American man in in California that reversed all of the civil rights uh, affirmative action programs that were set in place to make the playing field somewhat equal. Like, it's never going to be equal in our lifetime because right. it starts right. off unequal, right? So right. all of these have been dismantled. So you can only imagine that it's even less equal now than it was before he did the program because it wasn't fair when they started it. And now it's more unfair that they have these programs that you really can't have. Like, you know, you can't base anything on race or gender. Even if there's a disparity, they, they are saying that, you, you know, you have to prove that there's a disparity. That's obvious. But you got to prove it, it by a study. And that study has to be approved by a body for the and you to be able to use this information to have a balanced kind of uh, selection process, it be it in education sure. or procurement. So a black man led the initiative that caused that, wow. just met that for us. So, you know, so it's not always just about, it's more like we want representation that looks like us, but we also want their character and values Correct. and morals in line Correct. that was best for us in our community. You're very so much correct. <laughs> um, your company that you started, 360 Total uh, Concepts. Uh, if you could talk about that, and what do you guys, uh, what do you guys do? So we are a management consulting firm. We provide program management, 
um, community engagement and monitoring. And we also, we, but our core is equity, equity okay. participation. Our core is that we work on programs and policies and, and with mega projects to ensure that people, there's a diverse group of people that are working on these projects. That, okay. you know, no matter what area we're working on in these projects, that's always our core and our, our kind of North Star. Like we're always there advocating for, you know, women, minority owned businesses and diversity, more diversity on these projects than ever before. And if there's a program that's set, if there's not a program on these projects, we work to kind of build programs where they have a requirement that they're having okay. a certain level of participation. Or, um, and then, and that may look like, you know, local, small local participation. But it's always about equity. It's about equity and access. It's about equity and business opportunities. It's about equity in having a seat at the table and actually building capacity so you can build your own table and invite people to that okay. seat. So that's what it, in the genesis is that's what it is. We're about equity inclusion, but we work on these mega projects that are in the space of capital and infrastructure and um, facilities management. But we okay. also produce media content and television because we also want to highlight like how this money is being spent, where the money is being spent, and everything okay. visual now with social media that we're able to produce things so people can see. Because it's like it's one thing to hear these things, but when you see it, you're like, oh, okay, I get it. You yes. know, you guys are a part of that big rail project. You were part about that building going up. You know, like when you see something visual, it's more tangible to people to Correct. understand versus the whole, you know policy and theory part of it. And you're correct. And that's, that's a good thing about uh, social media uh, that you can do now is is you're not waiting on someone to tell your story. You actually can tell it yourself. And I see that you're the executive producer of your own uh, production company and you're making it happen. I'm, I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to walk with you. I'm trying right, to walk right, with you. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to walk with you. I'm trying to right. walk with you down here in Georgia. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, it, 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 with the internet, it's worldwide. So you can see it's in Georgia. Spotlight with Shonda. It's on, uh, you know, YouTube, Facebook. Yes. We have a website, and it's also on, um, on uh, I, I, IG too. And then my brother and I have a podcast called What Sibling Rivalry, and it's just talking about, you know, family values, the funny between my brother, who's an actor comedian, and me, who's in business. Yes. You know, the funny and the fun and the, and the informed. So, uh, and that's worldwide. We're in 20 different countries with the podcast. So okay. we're just trying to connect everything and be a, an <clears throat> information of celebrating Black ex excellence that has been going on for, you know, multi-generations. Right. And that's, and, and it's funny because that's, that's kind of uh somewhat what i'm what i'm doing because and that's why i wanted to have you on uh yeah, i tell people it's not all about trying to interview a quote-unquote you know uh celebrity because there are other other people doing <laughs> doing things and if you don't highlight them there's a young kid that may expire to do that but they don't think they can do it because they don't see that it's done so right. if you expose them to them you know i had the pleasure to um interview michelle hoskins who's the uh, only African American female at home, only uh, to have her own brand of syrup. So, uh, you know, yeah, she's been doing it 35 years. She's actually the real ancient mama. Wow. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So she's in, uh, she's in every Kroger's now. Wow. And, that's great. And she, she's in public. She's been doing it for 35 years. She has a great uh, story. Uh, so, you know, and like yourself, highlighting uh, our people to be, you know, because. Everybody's not going to be an actor. Everybody's not going to be a ball player. And these young kids today need to know there's something else you can be, you can do, that you can uh, have passion for. But they don't know unless we expose right. them uh, right. to someone, you know, like yourself that has a wealth of knowledge. Um, <clears throat> can you tell me also about the, um, the Pink Access uh, Foundation that you have? So the Inc the Pink Access Foundation I founded in 2011 in memory of my uh, cousin who had died of breast cancer at the age of 29. Okay. And so um, and it started with a friend of mine who was a cancer survivor who who was saying that she you know she paid rent for people who are survivors she gave all this money she had started this foundation but she couldn't get any of this large philanthropic money and I'm like really. 
I never realized, I never thought about where that money went or didn't go. You know, right. you always pink hat, pink, pink on, and you talk about this organization and the football players had the pink on, but you never right. thought about that, how that money was used and who that money goes to. And you're thinking, okay. Okay. if your auntie or your cousin or something happened to somebody in your family got sick, they need that person that's right there that they can touch to help them access sure. it. So sure. I started raising money. I was like, I raised money for in political space. I never raised in the philanthropic space. So I started raising for her organization. And so we started an event called Pink Access and Lavender 2. And you wore something pink. At first, it was just pink. And then we changed it to Lavender 2 because then we had men that were impacted with other cancers and other people sure. that were impacted. We wanted to celebrate survivors. So it was an annual event that we celebrate survivors by wearing something pink and lavender. And it was sponsor driven. So I raised this money through sponsorship so the people could come and have a free event to celebrate the ones that they loved that were impacted and those that had been impacted. So many of the survivors that I didn't even know would share with me like, this event is like our celebration, this celebration that we're thriving, right? And so that, and so I set up the foundation in honor of my cousin who really was the first person that I had been that deeply impacted that at a young age had died of something that now, you know, 10 years later, she probably could have lived because right. it was just that amount of time in the research that wasn't focused on women of color. So they, you know, so hers was found and she, they tried, but then nothing worked. And then a year after they had a year and a half after she was uh, diagnosed, she passed away at 29 and, you know, wow. just like your life just taken. And I just realized, remember thinking most friends, most people at 29 are wondering about how they're going to do something that's like not life. Right. And she's up here fighting for her life. I mean, she died at 29, but she got contract, you know, diagnosed at 27. So okay. at 27, instead of her worrying about, you know, if, if her boo didn't call her or if he right. was waiting, she worried about like her life, you know, she had to get uh, uh, her breast removed. I mean, things that, you know, at that young uh, of age, you don't usually have to deal, deal with. So um, I felt uh, years later, I felt like I needed to do something in honor of her. So I started participating in this swim a mile event where we would swim a mile for women with cancer. And then that's when I started doing the fundraising for my friend who then later, years later, was a survivor and she's still alive. She's still alive. Um, has started a foundation and really needed help to help women and people who were, you know, like in January, they find out they have cancer and they right. don't have any kind of savings to keep them through treatments for a year and a half. Her organization was, you know, Carrie's Touch was giving them money in failure, but she needed someone to be the angel to bless her. And so I was that angel to start a lot of the fundraising for her. And right now, um, my mom is now doing the pink access and she's revamping it to do okay. with it and changing the name and having the same mission, but taking it to another level. And she's an RN and a former, former uh, Navy nurse. So she's oh, like wow. the best person to be taking it on and taking it to another level. But that was the genesis of how I started it. And every year we'd have a pink access and lavender two event in the different NFL teams and NBA teams and Ben right. and Jerry's ice cream and all these different groups were part of the sponsors that supported me. So I was call people that I knew and say, you know, we're doing this. And everybody I called was like, my sister died of this or my, my mom died of this or my, you know, so everybody you realize is most people that you know has been, has not had cancer, but been impacted by, sure. by disease, by a family member or something directly. So it was one of those things that, everybody was able to support see and now now you understand why i asked you the first question i asked you <laughs> because you just a go-getter that's why i asked where's your you know how did you uh you know your entrepreneurial spirit because you know sometimes people see that and they say man somebody need to do something <laughs> And you didn't wait on somebody. You was like, I am the somebody. So right. we, we're about to make it we're about to make it happen. And 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 that's a life less sometimes we're asking people to do something that God is dropping in your spirit, but you asking somebody else to do it. Right. You need he dropped it in your spirit. So you the you know, supposed to be the one to run and do it. So right. we salute you for that. That's 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 that's, that's commendable. Um and How do you feel? Go ahead. You I'm sorry. How it all comes together. It's like, you know, you know God because mm -hmm. he put it all together for you. So, yeah. Yeah, well, hey, if he, you know, the, the, the blessed thing about God is that when he 
puts it in your spirit to do something, right? Or whether it's you, me, or anyone. What people don't understand, then he will also equip you mm-hmm. with it. He, I know it seems like when he tell you to do it, you're like, well, how am I going to do this? And all this stuff, don't, but he'll, he'll make the provision for it to happen. Right. He just want us to be in place. Once right. we're in place, then he'll like, okay, now nah, I'll, I'll do all the other maneuvering. Right. You know? And that's the, we just need to be obedient, you know, to what, what he's asking us and what he's calling us to do. Right. So, like I said, I appreciate you doing that. And, and that's why I wanted to ask you, you know, about that. Uh, how did it make you feel when you uh, received the Steve Awards for, uh, you know, Entrepreneur of the Year? Oh, the Stevie Award. That was, I mean, we were so, I mean, we were so surprised that we were selected. And then I like had my whole team, we they we're out, fly out to New York for the awards ceremony. So we made a whole weekend of it. And it was just like, it, when, it, when I saw all the other large organizations that were receiving awards too, I was just like, it was such an honor to be there and participate and for it to be, it, and I even said this in the interview that they have for us, it's like to have people outside of your community recognize you and your work, you know, speaks a lot right. to the work that you're doing because it's not people that you know. It's like these people, they don't know you. They know your work and they know, you know, your, you know, your, your legacy or your, your past performance. Right. And to be right. selected was, um, and then so many other blessings came from that. I got I, from that, um, this magazine called Enterprising Women Magazine saw me, and then they they awarded me the next year as the, the Enterprising Woman Women Woman of the Year, and I was able to meet so many amazing women with that magazine and that group, and then I was able to write an article that has become wow. a campaign wow. that I've started with the twelve new things about doing something new and different every month, so that you embrace change and that you change it to a positive evolution for yourself like if you're doing the same thing every day and it's working well do something different because that's going to take you to a whole nother level or if your company or anything happen in your life if you want to see a change the only thing you can control changing is you so in okay. order and that's the last thing people want to change is themselves but that's the first right. thing that's the only thing you can control and if you're in business that's the main thing you need to change if you want to see something different in your um, company because you're self-employed. So self is a big factor, right? So I came up with the 12 new things. I'm like, oh, let's do something new and different every month. So you just challenge people to do something new and different every month. It could be travel. It could be eating something different. It could just be an activity. It could just be driving to work a different way for the the next 30 days, each day finding a different route. It's like, but but in that process, you're opening yourself up for so much more abundance and clarity and opportunities that you didn't see. Because now if you're going the same way every day, you're seeing the same path. Well, now I'm going to go this different way. And then you see all these different things that you hadn't seen. And this opens up your creativity. It opens up opportunities. You know, it just opens you up to receive change. And then now in the midst of a pandemic, how important is it that you should be able to pivot and be able to change because you have to, right? Well, this made it a way it trains you to be embrace change in a fun way and, you know, not be so, you know, uh, disruptive and not traumatized. And I don't want to change. I've been this way all this time. It's working. Yeah. But everything must change. Seasons change. Everything. Yeah. 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 Cause everything is temporary. Right. So, but I mean, that's a good, that's a good, I never thought about that. Sometimes, you know, we always say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And, right. and, and what you're saying is, no, it, it's not that you're fixing it, but if you, you got to change something in order to expand yourself, to, to evolve right. as an individual. Right. So, exactly. <coughs> excuse me. That's on this, my show Spotlight with Shonda. I have these 12 new things, so I'm always posting something new and different. And people tag me and things that they're, they're doing new and different. They're like, I did this new and different. Like somebody went cherry picking and I had never gone cherry picking before. So I did it. They tagged me in their cherry picking excursion. And then like a couple of weeks later, I went cherry picking. I'm like, it's so such an amazing experience just to go like go out to the cherry fields, ch- pick cherries from the tree and take those same fruit home and eat that. You know what I mean? It's like how right. amazing is that? And in the midst of the pandemic, that's kind of the, an activity that you could do, you know, because it's not much you could could do with everything that was shut down at the time. So 
it, so it's, it's, it's a fun way of doing it. And people that follow me on the spotlight with Shonda are tag me on their 12 new things because it's making people get out of their comfort zone. And when we get out of gotcha. our comfort zone, that's when we grow. You, you're right about that. It's just that uh, we got to learn how to get out of our comfort zone. <laughs> so that's why 12 new things make it fun. So Correct. it's like, okay, even if you don't get out of your comfort zone just one day a month, just that mindset of you figuring out how to do something new and different is what changes you to be okay for when a pandemic hit and you have to change. You're not so traumatized. You know, it's not so anxiety ridden. You're like, oh, right. okay, I have to pivot. Let me think. Let me think what I'm going to have to do different now because I have to. But I train my mind to be mind okay too. with that. Right. Yeah, hey, that's but but that's good. That's good. I, I'm gonna start working on that as far as just you know just changing for the change for the same for the sake of changing. And that, that opens you up, like you said, to new ideas, new experiences. So the, and, and being more creative. Right. Being more creative. That's what it really does. So you gotta share with me when you do it, what you do and how it works for you, and what you learned in it too, you know, because it's like I tell you, I tell like, you oh, this opened up this over here. I wasn't even thinking that. I tell you, I know what my wife will say. She'll say, "Well, you can. I, I know twelve things you can change. You can, you can, you can clean this. You can clean that more. You can." <laughs> I like, no, no, that ain't what I'm trying to. That ain't what I'm trying to do. <laughs> well, you have to think of it. It has to be your thought. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> Our work. I saw you on um, the uh, Mike and Dunny show. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, and so. This question is kind of coming from that show, uh, that that dialogue you guys had. Let me sip my tea. Yeah, go, 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 go. so, and it, it's just a simple question, and and basically what it is is who is Shonda Scott? Oh, that came from that show. Yeah. Oh, who am I? Who am I? Well, I am. Like I was saying, well, I'm a child of the most high God. Let's just start there. Right. I am curious. I am creative. I'm more, I would say I'm a Southern male at heart because people see me as this California, you know, kind mm -hmm. of flower thing. But I'm, I am, I love the whole Southernness of life. You know, I do. I okay. love all that. The accents and everything. And, um, you know, I just, I just, and I, I'm actually a person that always is considerate and thinks about other people, you know, and so that's important to me. And, and now I'm being more of a person that also just thinks about what's good for me too. So I'm always evolving and growing even for me, even in myself, you know? And so, um, I guess, you know, that's it in a nutshell. I'm a pro businesswoman all the time and I'm always looking to do and pursue more and greater. Like, I feel like even if you, if one person has done something great, then God is showing you that that's a possibility. And if one person does it, that means it's no longer impossible. It's possible. So I'm always looking for what's possible in life okay. and achieve that. Even if it's a big pie in the sky dream, I just like to dream and, and, and see dreams fulfilled. You said something just then that I liked. Um, that's that's different. You you answered the question. Um, one of the and I'm I'm gonna point it out. But you said something that I've never heard anybody say. Said it, which was you talked about you know being a child of God. You talked about being considerate and all these things, but then you said what was unique was you said, but I'm a businesswoman at all times. <laughs> now, no, no. Let me tell you why that's unique. There's a difference of you saying that. And there's a difference of you saying, I'm a CEO, I'm this, I'm that, because then you're talking about what you do. Mm -hmm. But when you talked about who you are, you mentioned that because, and probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably because you're saying, in my DNA, I'm always owning and trying to figure out a way to, like you said, to do what's uh, in my best interest. So in my best interest, it's not necessary to work for somebody. I have to own it. So for me to own it, I got to be a business. So that's just in your, because you said it's in your blood. But it's the way you phrased it. Uh, where it, it, you wasn't saying what you do. You're saying who you are. And that just happens to be in your DNA to be who you are. 
Yes, I guess it just happens to be. <laughs> well, you say you come from a generation, right, so right right, 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 right. You don't know. In right. other words, you don't know any other way. So the reason, but I work for other people, so I know other ways. And the and the benefit of me having been an entrepreneur, baby, or around mm -hmm. that when I work for any other company, I understand what they're going home with, or I understand what sure, makes this sure. business work. So I'm not looking at it as a. Uh, I'm an employee. I'm really looking at their business in the mindset of it's my business. And that's kind of like an ideal employee that you want is someone sure. who's looking at your business and, and benefit as if it's their business, you know, a different appreciation for the work. They have a different appreciation of how what you're having to go through. And they have a different appreciation of overhead and costs and things that you know, most people don't think about if they're getting paid. They're like, I'm just looking like I'm getting my paycheck every two weeks. I'm not really worried about how you had to pay me or what you had to do to pay me or right. how much it is to make sure I'm paid. You know, that's how a, a, most people look at it. But if you come with an entrepreneurial mindset in any role that you're in, you're thinking about it more than just this, you know, one transactional exchange. You're thinking about the whole system that makes this right. work, what makes it successful. I mean, I learned the valuable lesson when I had a gourmet coffee house like years ago. I mm. remember my parents, I realized like how, you know, everybody wants to be a millionaire, everybody wants to be a millionaire. I'm like, I realized right. how many right. $1 bills it takes to be a millionaire in the coffee business. Cause you're like, that's a lot of cup of coffee. You gotta be, you know, like you think about it differently when you think about people want to be a millionaire. You know how many $1 bills that is? You know, like when you right. break it down to like, you know how much, if you think about it that way, you think about how much work that takes. You think about how sure. much goes into sure. getting there versus people just thinking it's like this, shake this tree and all this money just flows down. Like, I, 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 wish it, I wish it did happen like that. Right. <laughs> right. But that's how people think of it. Like, you know, you know, I want to be, it's good to think that, but then you also have to layer it with, what does it take to be that? You know. Well, it's interesting that you say that because I had forgot a, 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 a biblical uh, principle, which was, like you said, a lot of people, you know, they go to work, right? They do the job, right? And they, boom, they, they gone. They, like you said, they're not thinking about the, the company. They're not looking overall. And so you don't really put your best foot forward. And right. then people don't understand why it's hard for them to get their own business. Exactly. And that uh, because they forget this biblical principle says, be faithful to that, which is another man's. Then God will bless you with your own. So for all people that are inspiring to uh, have their own business, what, whatever that is, right. is that you need to be faithful to which, who you work for first. Exactly. Then, then, because like you said, when you start looking for employees of your own business, would you hire you? Right. right, 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 and people don't think about that, and they don't realize like they want to do and be all this. It's like, what does it take to be that? And are you being that in the what you're being stewarded? Right. Over? Like, like what you are some of the time is what you are all of the time. Like I tell people, like you, what mm -hmm. however you handle this business is how you're going to handle your business. You know, it's like lessons learned. Like I can't work, I can't you know, provide my clients, uh, we can't provide our clients good service if we're not being of good service to ourselves, you know? So it's like, yes. if you're yes. not providing, taking care of your business, then how can you take care of somebody else's business? And most people miss that because they're, because everyone's so in the future and then leaving the present and not doing the planting the seeds here oh, for that wow. future. See, you just, you know what, see, God is awesome. You know, I, you just said something and I, I'm going I'm to give you the people who said the same thing. You all are saying it in a different way, but you're saying the same thing. So the first person was Chris Broussard, Fox Sports analyst, Chris Broussard. He said, Hey, you know, a lot of people come with a podcast show. A lot of people want to be on ESPN or on Fox and say, Hey, I can, I can talk sports. I can do this. And he said, Oh, just they forget to do one thing and that's to be great at what they're doing right now. So you're trying to skip steps. And then Michael Collier said it in a different way, which was I asked him, how do you play a, a, a role, right? That's not a big role in a movie or a TV show, but make it rememberable. Mm -hmm. And he said, because you never look at the part like it's small. Mm -hmm. You never look at how many lines you have. You look at and you stretch the character out as far as the producers and the directors will, you know, allow you to go. And so 
then when you, when you just made that, you know, comment just now, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's that you can't take shortcuts. If you got this little thing, then you got to be the best at that little thing. And then as you continue to grow, uh, because like you said, you didn't get to where you are now by saying, okay, well, this really ain't too much or nothing. I just kind of do this over here. And because somebody, like you said, being entrepreneur of the year, somebody's looking. You didn't even know they were looking. Right, right. You didn't know they were looking, but somebody was looking. And you was like, what, me? Right. And, like, and like you said, you don't even know these people. Right. And they, and they recognize you for pre, uh, from, from President Obama to say, hey, look, I need something done. I want you to come on on the team, and I want you to help facilitate this. And that that is so invaluable because that means you take pride and mm -hmm. joy uh, in whatever that you're you're doing. You saw a friend from 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 cancer and said, hey, you know what? You weren't waiting on nobody to to start something. You said, I got it. Let me run with it. And now, like you said, what it what it's you know grown into. Your mother is taking over. So, like I said, I salute you. I tip my hat to you because. It's it it is an example for us all that's striving to get to you know wherever place you're trying to get to in life, but do your best. And so I've always felt like what I had to do is not worried about the interviews I don't get, mm -hmm. but the ones I get, try to make them the best interviews uh, that I can. So I try not to have a, I try to do my interviews where you're not having the same conversation you had. With the right. last couple of people that you interviewed with, and that's that's how I try to uh, you know to do it because I'm trying to stand out because there's right. a lot of competition with. So I appreciate that example that you have uh, you know that that you set in that trail that you have blazed. Thank you, thank you. But so that's true. That's just the the way it is. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Don't be apologetic. It's, 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 it's in your DNA. Just get so, over it. No shortcuts. My mom told me that one time. I said, Mommy, it's hard work to answer. She's like, it's the answer. And you're like, she looks half her age. She's done a lot of great things. I'm like, so it's hard, hard work to answer. It's like, that, sorry, can't get around it. You know, they try, people try, you know, and, and it's short lived. Like, you may get something quick, but it's a flash in the pan. Like, we talk about the long marathon. Right. You know, so right. longevity. It's like, there's things that take that, you know, you have to get there. And that's what, that's the, the blessing of the internet is the quick access and accessibility. The curse of the internet is that this is a generation that doesn't realize there's a long, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So everything's so quick to them that, you know, a year, five years seems like forever, you know, like, right. you know, how do I get here tomorrow? You know, you can't appreciate the present in the moment because it's like, it's creating, everything yeah. is so yeah. quick. You think, but you don't really know, you know, if you read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, you realize 10,000 hours, like somebody, by the time we saw Michael Jackson, he was a master at what he did because he had been doing it since he was five years old. So for him to do Thriller, of course, he's going to do Thriller because he's like, by the time he, when he did Thriller, it was like equivalent to someone 50 years old because he had done all it that. Done it. It, it, it was already a lifetime. Right. You're correct. Yeah. Well, and even did, then, and even it. then, and even then, he still was studying right. people that came before him. You, and a you, master you, of it. Like, just think about Beyonce. She's been doing this since she was seven years old. So by the time she's 30, she's like a 50-year-old woman as far as experience and skill and trade. You know, the perfectionism right. that goes behind that, the work that goes behind it. It's like, she doesn't just come up with a video and that's it. It's like, I'm going to do a video. We're going to go get a camera. We're going to go. No, she has a whole concept, a whole process, a whole team, and then rehearsal and rehearsal and rehearsal and reenacting it as if it's the real day. And it's not the day. It's nobody there. and You're practicing. So then the right. day when everything's going on, you are there, you know, so people don't understand all that that takes to be that, to get there. Like I said, they don't really under to get what it takes to be great. I want to be great. Right. That's wonderful. Now, what does that mean? And what does that take? And what will you have to do? And what are you needing to do now to be great? 
like you said, every day you can be great. In that moment, what you're doing, are you greatly studying and preparing for this moment, for this interview right. that's now, for something that could be, you know, a world stage later? Like, you don't just get the world stage. Right. <laughs> You know, wake up and I'm on the world stage, you know, because then you're like this, you know, you're doing the Cindy Brady, you're, you're freezing, you know, you're not prepared. It's all preparation. And all of the preparation is really the work in the in the in the glory is all in the preparation. When they finally see it, it's like a plant that's been watered. By the time you see the flower bloom, that plant's been moving. It's been it's growing not, all along. Yeah, yeah. Right, all that time. It wasn't just sitting there and then all of a sudden a flower, you know, so... Mm-hmm. Well, that's, I, that's what people have to learn. Well, I appreciate you sharing your words of wisdom uh, with us. Um, I appreciate you coming on the show. Like I said, I don't take it for granted. Uh, thank you for blessing uh, uh, blessing us with your presence. And I'm going to continue to watch watch from afar, far as what you do. And, and, you know, look at the examples and try to do what I can within the lane that I'm trying to pursue, you know, for myself. Well, thank you. And thanks for your platform and using your vo- voice to get, you know, messages out and stories told and people exposed. We appreciate that. That I takes a lot. It. Okay. Well, once again, thank you for coming on again, Shonda. And okay. stay safe and be blessed. You too. Talk to you later.